Greetings friends, my name is Lucas Mann and I am the pastor of the Spring Church. Just up the road right here on your left as you turn on 221 as you're going toward Lawrence. Just a few hundred feet up the road. And uh, friends, myself and uh, a brother of mine, a, a fellow soldier of the cross, come out here this afternoon to bring to you the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the message of life, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, that Jesus Christ is King, and that He reigns over the universe, and that all things are in His hands. He controls all things. That He Himself died for His people and was raised again three days later. And that all who embrace Him, all who repent and believe the Gospel, the Gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, are saved. They are eternally justified. Friends, we're here to warn you about sin. Warn you about the fact that if you are outside of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you are on your way to destruction, on your way to the place that is a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth, the place of torment for the wicked. And friends, we do not want you to go there. We want you to enter into heaven. We want you to, to be received into glory when you die. And such a thing, such a great and mighty, wonderful thing, can only come about by the grace of God. It is by grace. Ultimately, it is so that God might receive the glory. God has so ordered the economy of salvation to be that it is all of His unmerited favor. That is, He shows favor to those who did not work for it. And it is all ultimately that He might be glorified, that He might be worshipped, that He might be honored. God is jealous for His glory, my friends. Jealous for His praise and honor. And He's jealous to receive all the glory in all things ultimately. Not just in salvation, but also in the creation of this world. He is glorified. And in, this, in His sustaining this world, He is glorified. God said to the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 48 verse 11, He says, For my own sake, for my own sake I will act. For how can my name be profaned? And my glory I will not give to another. He will not give His glory to pastors. He will not give His glory to priests. He will not give His glory to the Pope. He is jealous for all the glory. And so therein do we find that the triune God, out of jealousy for His own glory, works alone by His own strength and power to bring His name glory. To bring His name praise. And so therefore, let us not be so proud and so self-righteous as to think that we, my friends, accomplish salvation by our own works. No man can save him by his own might and strength. It is the power of God that saves sinners. Paul himself said in Romans 1.18, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Later on, he said in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Indeed it is. My friend and I come out here this afternoon with full confidence in the power of the Gospel to save you because it, by His power, by His strength, by God's strength, we have been saved. The power of God that is manifested and put on display in the Gospel. So we point you to Jesus Christ. We point you to the Lamb of God who was slain upon the cross of Calvary for His people. That He came into the world to save His people from their sins, as Matthew 1.21 clearly propounds. Romans 10, or excuse me, Romans chapter 11, verse 10 says, or, I'm sorry, excuse me, Romans chapter 10, verse 11 says, For the Scripture says, Whoever believes will in Him, or in Him will not be disappointed. 
Praise be to God that Christ is a powerful, sufficient, glorious Savior. Amen and amen indeed. The text of Scripture that I would like to direct your attention to this afternoon, the passage that I would like to highlight and explain to you is in Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, verse 24. The Apostle Paul, writing here under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God, writes this, being justified as a gift by His grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. And that is the issue I would like to deal with. The subject that I would like to speak on. That salvation, that justification is by grace. How can we be justified? How can man be right with the Holy God? For we find in Scripture clearly that man is at war with God. That he is doing battle with the Holy One. And of course we know that he certainly will have no advantage even for a moment. But God will destroy the wicked in His wrath. But however we find in Scripture that there are promises concerning salvation. That God justifies. That God pardons sinners. And how can that be how can such a thing take place? The answer that we find from Scripture in this verse specifically is that it is by grace. But not just grace in this abstract idea, but grace manifested. Grace manifested in the work of the Son of God who came to accomplish redemption for His people. So therefore, it is these truths that I seek to make known this afternoon as we look at this text. But before we deal with it, I want to continue, I want to contemplate what Paul has said thus far and what he is going to say later on in this chapter. Paul is explaining here in Romans 3 the fallenness of man. Very thoroughly in the beginning, the beginning half or the first half of the chapter, he quotes a lengthy portion of Old Testament scriptures to show the reader their need for salvation. To show them how sinful they are. He says in verse 10, There is none righteous, quoting the Old Testament. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. Their throat is an open grave. With their tongues they keep deceiving. The poison of asps is under their lips whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness, their feet are swift to shed blood. So he's quite thorough and he's quite bold and straightforward here on this very profound truth that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But he does not leave the reader hopeless, but he gives the hope of the Gospel. In the second half of chapter 3, he gives the hope of the good news of Jesus Christ. He says in verse 24, being justified as a gift by His grace through the redemption, which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation. That is, wrath has been absorbed in His blood through faith. Later on he says, <clears throat> verse 30, since indeed God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised is one. So God saves by grace and He warranted His saving sinners by His grace through the redemptive work of His Son, through the finished work of Jesus Christ. And this is glorious. This brings comfort to the heart of the sinner. For therein do we see that God can be both just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So therefore, let us look closely at verse 24, which speaks to justification by grace. Verse 24 says, being justified. And now we'll stop right there very briefly. Justify. What does that word mean? What does it mean to be justified? 
what does the word justification mean? All of them mean the same thing, but what is the meaning? Justify means to declare righteous in this context. It means to regard as righteous, to treat as righteous. And that is very important that we understand that. Really, the text could be read, being regarded as righteous as a gift by His grace. That is how it could be read. But we want to stay truer to the original Greek where this word is clearly brought forth. That they are regarded as righteous. Sinners who would otherwise be regarded as sinners, having believed the gospel, are now regarded as saints. And friends, this is why you must run to the Lord Jesus Christ. If you are outside of Him, you're on your way to destruction. Turn to Christ. Turn to the Lord Jesus Christ and live so that God would regard you as righteous, though in fact you are a sinner. He would regard you as holy, though in fact you are unholy. All because of the work of His Son, the Redeemer of God's elect. So therefore we know what the word justify means. So we could read the text, being regarded as righteous, as a gift, as a gift, my friends. Salvation is not a reward for the righteous, but a gift for the guilty. It is not something that holy people earn by their materialist works. If you think that Christianity, my friends, is simply a system of rules that people ought to follow so that they would enter God's kingdom, so that they would be saved, that's foolishness and it is wrong. Salvation, Christianity in its essence, is a religion of grace. It is the only true religion. Because it is not necessarily about following rules and trying to earn salvation by your work. That's a dead man's religion. That's a lost man re man's religion. That's a religion that will damn you. True religion in the sight of God, my friends, is salvation by grace. Grace, my friends. What is grace? Some have turned it into an acronym. God's riches at Christ's expense. And that is true. But grace in its ordinary definition means unmerited favor. Favor that one shows another apart from materialist action, apart from works. You, my friends, who grew up having gracious parents have experienced this many times. For when you sinned or when you rebelled against your parents, oftentimes they would show mercy to you and not give you what you rightly deserve and instead show grace. But my friends, God's grace is so much greater than this. Greater than any kind of grace a human can manifest toward another. It is much more. Much more glorious. Much more weighty. Much more powerful. That is why P Paul could later on say in Ephesians 2, that we are saved by grace. As a gift by His grace. When God saves a sinner, He gives them grace. But Paul here calls it a gift. A gift, my friends. There is a gift that is offered before you this day. The free offer of salvation, of forgiveness of sin, of eternal life in the Lord Jesus Christ. And my friends, this is the Lord with whom you must deal. This is the Christ with whom you must deal and contend with. Choose this day whom you shall serve. Friends, the offer of life is before you. And it is a gift that speaks to its nature. Because if it was by works, if salvation were by the works of the law, then it certainly could not be called a gift. It would be called that which is due. It would be called that which we rightly deserve to be given to us. But my friends, it is a gift, truly a gift, all of grace. Isaiah 55, 1 says, Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. That is the offer that is laid before you this day.
Later on in this chapter, it says in verse 6, Seek the Lord while He may be found. Call upon Him while He is near. Let the wicked forsake His way and the righteous, unrighteous man his thoughts and let him tur return to the Lord and he will have compassion on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts nor are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. Oh, my friends, the, the offer of God's gracious gift of eternal life is laid bare before you today. So cr come to Christ and live. Have life. Have redemption. Have forgiveness of sin and the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ given to you as a gift of grace. Salvation is not a reward for the righteous, but a gift for the guilty. A gift for those who otherwise could not earn it. You can't earn it. You're a vile wretch, just as I am. I can't earn it. It has to be given, otherwise we will never have it. It has to be granted to us from on high, otherwise we would never be saved. Salvation does cost something. It cost great. It cost Christ a great amount of suffering. In fact, it's an infinite price. The Lamb of God upon the cross bore the infinite wrath of God against sin and was raised on the third day. The work of Jesus Christ in His perfect life and His sinless death and even now in His constant intercession on behalf of those who will draw near to God through Him, it cost Christ everything. It cost Christ His life. And there upon that cross He was spent. The wrath of God was spent upon Him. So therefore, let us not think that salvation is a light thing. Let us not consider it as something that ought to be treated lightly, because it is not. Salvation costs so much, and it costs the Lamb of God everything. And therefore, when a sinner is converted, their hearts are excited, now raised to spiritual life, and now desire to serve the Lord Jesus Christ, not out of a sense of, well, if I don't do this, I'm not converted, or if I don't do this, then I won't be forgiven, but because they themselves have been forgiven and have been pardoned, and because Christ died for them. And the other motive for holiness is idolatry. So going back to Romans 3.24, it says, being justified as a gift by His grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. Through the redemption. The redemption, my friends. Redemption has been purchased. Paul speaks of it here as if it has already been done because it has been. The work of salvation has been complete. Paul speaks of it in the present tense in the book of Ephesians. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7, when he says, In Him that is Christ, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace, which He lavished on us in all wisdom and insight. Oh, my friends, how precious and how glorious that is. So you would do well to embrace the Lord Jesus Christ, to flee your rebellion, to flee your pride, to flee your idolatry and your lust, and to come and have life. I speak not only from the authority of Scripture, but even experientially, because I myself have been saved by the grace of God. I myself have been given this gift of life, and I have tasted and seen that the Lord is good. Through the redemption, which is in Christ Jesus, Paul is emphatic here. It's not in anyone else. It's not any other place. It is not in you. It is not in me. It is not in a pastor or priest. It is not in the Pope. It is not in any man. It is not in Mohammed. It is not in Buddha. It is not in any other religious leader. It is in the Lord Jesus Christ. And even His name testifies of His ministry. What does the name Christ mean? It means anointed. Anointed one. He was set apart, my friends, to be the Lord's Christ. And then the name Jesus, the name Jesus, we get it from Latin, which comes from Hebrew, I mean, which comes from Greek. The Greek comes from Hebrew. 
The, de the name that Jesus had in Hebrew was Yeshua. And Jesus, that Hebrew name means Yahweh saves. Even Jesus' own name testifies of what He came to do. Came to save. He came to save sinners. So are you a sinner? Yes. As we find in the same chapter in the previous verse, for all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. No exceptions to the rule. No exceptions to this truth. So therefore, you sinners, you drunkards, you who are sexually immoral and perverse, you who love this present world, you who are lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, embrace the Lord Jesus Christ. Flee your sin, lest you be damned, lest you be lost. And please come to Christ that the love of God might be shed abroad in your heart. That the mercy of God might be manifest to you. It is all in Christ Jesus. And why is it in Christ Jesus? Well, of course, He is jealous for the glory, as I said. And therefore, He is the center of the Gospel. He is the focal point of the good news. In fact, Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, when he says, this is the Gospel I preach to you, speaking to the Corinthians, what does he say? He doesn't say God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. He says, Jesus Christ died for sin and was raised on the third day. That's what he propounds as the Gospel. That's what he says the Gospel is. That Jesus Christ died and rose again for sinners. It is all about Jesus, my friends. All about Christ. So that Christ is glorified in all things. Who is the God of glory? Who is the true God? Well, this God, His name is Yahweh, and He reigns over the universe. He is the Lord who has made you and me in all things and sustains them by His power. The one true God. And this God is holy. A holy God. We must understand that God is set apart from all that is perverse and wicked and all that is evil and, and ungodly, and He Himself in all His ways is righteous. God says to the Israelites in Leviticus chapter 11, verse 45, He says, For I am Yahweh who brought you up from the land of Egypt to be your God. Thus you shall be holy, for I am holy. We also know from the Psalms and we know also from Romans 3 as I just was there. My friends, we know that God is righteous. That He is right in all His ways. Perfect in all His deeds. And speaking of His holiness, the word holy means sanctified, set apart. God is set apart from this perverse world and from you and me. He is not like us. His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are greater, higher, and more expansive than our thoughts. Let us not think that He is like us. God is also gracious and compassionate. He abounds in loving kindness. He is so merciful. God is merciful. Listen to what Psalm 33 says. Psalm 33 verse 1, Sing for joy in the Lord, O you righteous ones. Praise is becoming to the upright. Give thanks to the Lord with the lyre. Sing praises to Him with a harp of ten strings. Sing to Him a new song. Play skillfully with a shout of joy. For the word of the Lord is upright and all His work is done in faithfulness. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the loving kindness of Yahweh. Hallelujah unto God. Indeed, the whole earth is full of the loving kindness of Yahweh. But my friends, that never negates His holiness. That never throws His righteousness off to the side. But rather, it establishes it. But rather, they stand in perfect harmony with one another.
And my friends, God in His perfect holiness has given His law. It is His Ten Commandments, which those of you who have grown up in church, who have grown up in a religious atmosphere will know, are God's moral standard, are God's holy laws. And they have been given unto us to show us God's character, how He is holy, how He is righteous, how is He good. When we go to the law and we see. And we also see our character in light of God's character therein in the law of God. But first I want to see God's righteous character. For we find in the law of God, God says in verse 3 of Exodus 20, You shall have no other gods before me. Going down to verse 14, He says, You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. So God's holy law shows us His character. Before we look at these commands, we look at the one in verse 3. God forbids that the Israelites t would lie. Or, um, excuse me, not lie, but to commit idolatry. So He says, you shall have no other gods before me. God is jealous. That is why He's given this command. It shows us His character. Not jealous in the sinful way as often we think. In the holy way. He is righteous, my friends. Righteous is the Lord. And perfect is He. Indeed. And indeed. Verse 14, You shall not commit adultery. God is faithful. Therefore, He demands that spouses be faithful. You shall not steal. God owns all things. Therefore, He does command us to do this very thing. To keep ourselves from stealing, from thievery, lest we disobey God and break His commands. And my friends, in the law of God do we find our character displayed to us. It's a mirror. It shows us how sinful we are. For we see the command, you shall have no other gods before me. Have you ever worshipped anything besides the true God? Have you worshipped any other God besides Yahweh? Well, He is jealous for His glory, my friends, and He holds you accountable for breaking His law. You shall not commit adultery. Have you looked with lust? Have you looked at a woman with lust? Have you viewed pornography recently? My friends, that is breaking God's law. That's adultery in the heart. That is committing adultery in your heart. Have you stolen something before? Then you've broken God's law. You've broken God's holy law. You shall not bear false witness. Have you lied? The book of Revelation tells us all liars will have their place in the lake of fire. I don't want you to go there, friends. I'm warning you. That's why I'm out here. To plead with you to come to the Lord Jesus Christ. I plead with you to turn from your sin and to embrace the Savior. And God will pardon you. God will save you from hell and the power of, your, uh, the power of sin in your life right now, presently. By His grace and for His glory. So therefore we find ourselves as lawbreakers. I am not excluding myself from this. Rather I stand alongside of you saying, absolutely, I am as you are, a sinner. By default, an enemy of God. By default, outside of Christ. By default, an, an enemy of the Most High. And in His wrathful hands. And His wrath is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in their unrighteousness. And friends, there is bad news. We are headed for hell outside of Christ. You are headed for destruction. If you know not the love of God as it is revealed in Christ, if you are not saved this day, if you're not born again, don't lose your soul for your sins. 
Come to the Lamb of God. O oh, sinners, O oh, ye who are weary, come to Christ that you may live. The wrath of God is revealed, my friends, from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. And many people are uncomfortable with this truth. Many pastors don't preach this truth. But this is what the Scriptures say. God has wrath for the wicked. God hates the hands that shed innocent blood. As Proverbs 6 tells us. He abhors the man of bloodshed and deceit. And for those who are outside of Christ, when they die, if you were outside of Christ and you were to die today outside of Christ, you would end up in hell. The wicked are sent to hell. God sends the soul to hell. People don't send themselves to hell. God does. Because He is holy. He sends the wicked to that place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. John, John, I need a Gatorade. I'm a little lightheaded. Thank you. He sends the, the soul to destruction. Thank you, brother. Thank you so much. Mm. Mm, God bless you. My friends, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. And hell is the place of punishment for the wicked. Hell is that place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus talked about it more than He did about heaven. He wanted to warn sinners of the impending judgment. That God, that God destroys the soul in hell. So I don't want you to go there, friends. But that is where you are headed. With no hope in and of yourselves. With no hope in and of yourselves. But praise be unto the Most High. Praise be to the Maker of heaven and earth that He saves sinners. That Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. In fact, I love what Matthew, it says in Matthew 1. <coughs> Excuse me. In Matthew chapter 1, the angel appears to, uh, to Joseph in a dream. It says in verse 21, this is the angel speaking to Moses, uh, excuse me, and to Joseph. He says, She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Christ came into the world to save sinners. Why did he do that? Because, my friends, in eternity past, the Father selected His people unto glory. He predestined those who would be saved unto life and left the rest to continue on in their sins. And He commissioned His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to come and to die for this select people. And therefore, He would re be rewarded and exalted as a result of, his, of what He did. And the Spirit of God likewise also agreed to come and to equip Christ and then to also apply the benefit of His work to the hearts of those people the Father chose to save. <coughs> Excuse me. And so therefore we find in Scripture that in Galatians 4, 4 it says when the fullness of the times came, Christ, my friends, Christ came and was born under the law. Born of a virgin. He fulfilled God's law for His people. Lived in perfect submission and obedience to the law of God that you and I could never fulfill. That you and I could never keep. He obeyed it. He loved the Lord as God with all His heart, mind, soul, and strength. And He loved His neighbor as Himself. Perfectly.
and then he willingly laid down himself to be beat and to be whipped, to be spat upon and made a public mockery, to bear upon himself the wrath of the Father against the sins of the people of God. That upon that cross where Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. That He took ownership of the sins of the people of God. That He took ownership of my sin. He was credited with having committed the sin that I've committed long before I was even born. What great love has God for His people? What great mercy and grace has God for His church? That He would send His Son to die for them. That He'd send His Son to die for those poor, miserable souls. And upon that cross, Christ bore the wrath of the Father. Listen to what He says in Mark chapter 15, verse 34. It says, At the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama shabakathani, which is translated, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And as Isaiah 53, 10 says, It pleased Yahweh to crush Him. It pleased the wrath of the Father. It satisfied. The death of Jesus Christ satisfied the wrath of the Father. And there was not a drop or an ounce left for the people of God. And my friends, there is more glorious news. Christ is alive. He rose from the grave. He is alive today. Hallelujah unto God. Hallelujah. Amen. To God be the glory for the great things He has done indeed. He rose on the third day. The angel told the women in Mark 16, verse 6, as the, as the women went to the tomb that morning, that early Lord's Day morning there, and they saw that Jesus was not there, but an angel was there, He says, Do not be amazed. You are looking for Jesus in Nazarene who has been crucified. He has risen. He is not here. Behold, here is the place where they laid Him. The tomb is empty, friends. Hallelujah unto God. The work of the Redeemer has been accomplished. And 40 days later, after being raised from the grave, Christ was exalted in glory. He was exalted in heaven. He was exalted to the right hand of the throne of God on high having accomplished redemption once for all. And there He sits. There He sits, receiving the glory and praise and worship of angels. There He sits as the King of the universe. There He sits as the Lamb of God. There He sits as the Son of God and Son of Man, therefore able to intercede for God and man. In between God and man. And therefore, Jesus said in Mark 1.15, you must repent and believe that gospel. Repentance is a brokenness over sin. You must be broken and flee your rebellion. Flee your filth. Flee your pornography. Flee your sexual morality and run to Jesus Christ. Believe upon Jesus. Have faith in God. Faith that Jesus accomplished salvation once for all. And the Father will pardon you of all sin, past, present, and future because of the work of Christ, because of the work of the Redeemer. And He will wrap you in the righteousness of Christ, because Christ lived for you if you are His. Christ fulfilled the law for you if you are in Him. Christ Jesus takes upon Himself my guilt and I am credited with His righteousness. He bears my iniquities upon His body. He bears in His body on the tree my sin. And I get His righteousness. How wonderful is the grace of God. How glorious. Hallelujah unto God that it is by grace, 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 my friends. All a gift of grace. The love of God, how rich and pure. 
how measureless and strong it shall forevermore endure. Hallelujah! Friends, God is wrathful though. He is also wrathful. Flee your sin. His wrath is soon kindled against the wicked. And come to Christ that His love might be shed abroad in your heart. Titus 3.5 says He saved us not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to His mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. I want to say very briefly what the meaning of this word regeneration is. We obviously know that the word generate means to create. Therefore, the prefix re simply means to create again, to recreate. And therein is the meaning of this precious word. When a, when a soul is justified, when a sinner is regarded as righteous by the grace of God, they are also regenerated. They are also recreated. They have a new nature with a new heart and new desires. The one who has been truly saved, they now love God and love holiness, love the prayer, love the Word of God, love the fellow, uh, to be fellow citizens with the saints. They delight in God's truth. They hate sin. They're broken over sin. They're disgusted with sin because they've been regenerated. They have been recreated. And this is by the grace of God. This is by God's grace. So friends, if you say that you know Christ, that you have had a religious experience at church, that someone who is in a religious position of leadership has affirmed your Christianity, my friends, I exhort you to examine yourselves to see whether you truly know Christ, to see whether you are truly in the faith or not. For there are many who name the name of Jesus who are in hell. There are many right now who say they know Christ, but they're going to go to hell. There are many, many on the road to destruction. There are few who find the road to life. Few who find the path to life. Few there be that find eternal life. So if you, know, if you say that you know Christ, I, ex I ask you to examine your life to see whether you live for Christ. To see whether you desire Christ, desire holiness, desire to glorify Him, or whether you're simply a religious hypocrite, and whether you just live in sin without any conviction over sin, and you're not broken over your sin, in that case you're lost and you need to repent and believe the gospel. And if so, if you see that you have borne fruit of conversion that God has brought about for your actions, your deeds, your thoughts, your intentions of your heart, your desires to all be changed by His grace. Hallelujah. And give God glory for that because He did it for His own glory. Friends, salvation is not by works, it is by grace. But the evidence of salvation is that one will work and bear fruit of it. One will bear fruit of the fact that God has done a work in them. They will display that. Because God has saved them. It is God saving sinners, not sinners saving themselves. All by grace, my friends. All by God's unmerited free favor. And it is all for the glory of God. Ultimately, that's what it's for. It's for the glory of God. The end of Hebrews in chapter 13, verse 20 reads, Now the God of peace who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the eternal covenant, even Jesus our Lord, equip you in every good thing to do His will, working in us that which is pleasing in His sight, through Jesus Christ, 
to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Indeed, to Jesus Christ be all glory and all honor and praise forever. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Indeed. Christ is worthy of the glory. So may He be glorified in all things forever. Amen. You who are pagans, you who are living in sin, stop sinning. Stop sinning. Stop walking in iniquity and come to Christ for life. You who say, yes, I have come to know Him. Well, as the book, the book of 1 John says, the one who says, I have come to know Him and does not keep His commands is a liar. So therefore, if you love Christ, you will obey Him. And if not, if you see that in your life you do not obey Christ, then you're lost and you need to be saved. But if you see that you yourself bear fruit of conversion and you are saved, hallelujah unto God. Hallelujah that God has done a work in you and that God has raised you to spiritual life. And therefore, give glory to God. Give glory to God. The gospel is not just for the lost, it is for the child of God to feed upon and to rest in daily. It is the daily gospel. It is our manna from heaven. If you are a child of God, you must daily be reminding yourself of the truths of the gospel. And then you must go and proclaim it to your lost family members, to your lost friends, to this lost and dying world. You must proclaim it with boldness, passion, and fervency by the grace of God and for the glory of God. The gospel is for the child of God to rest in, to feed upon, but also to go and share with a lost and dying world that God might be honored in their salvation. So we have seen here in Romans chapter 3, verse 24, that justification is a gift of grace. It is by grace. That Christ purchased redemption by His own power. That Jesus purchased redemption. Not some of Jesus, some of us. All Jesus. All of Him. So that Jesus receives all the glory. We have seen how we ourselves have sinned. We have rebelled against God. You have rebelled against God. And we all deserve hell for our sin. And we are by default condemned to go there. However, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through Him. He who believes in Him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So Christ has come to die and to rise again. And for all those who repent and believe on Him, for all of those who embrace Him, they will be saved. They will receive eternal life. All by God's grace. And all for God's glory. So may God be brought all glory in both your life and in mine. In this world, in this nation, in this state, in this county. In all things as they redound to His glory. May the triune God receive all glory, honor, and praise forever and ever. Amen and amen.